I, I yes, I uploaded it, but please don't do that. <laughs> um, the, the system's funny, and stuff that we load in the last minute may not actually show up. So, oh, yeah. yeah. And it causes us stress to have to do it the last minute, too. But now you know. <laughs> Okay, are we somewhat ready? Yeah. Let's see. I was wondering. Yeah. I know. Yeah, it's that time of the week. It is. Normally we don't even have the session booth, so. Let's just talk to you through that, Sean. Yeah. yeah, Friday afternoon sessions can be a lot more intensive. Imagine Friday afternoon in this time. It's going to be a good ghost town. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. Understood. No, I'm I'm No. Well then probably never put this one because Friday at night. Yes, yeah, so this is not a show. <laughs> If I put up my laptop to see the speaker's names on the table, or do I get a share? Um, what is your friend? Mm, not for the speaker names. Bring, bring your laptop up. Bring your laptop up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get started in just another minute. And, and just in case you're wondering, this is HTTP BIS. If you're here for something else, this is the wrong room. Oh, yeah. Uh, is, is anyone willing to uh, be our scribe for this session? Can we have volunteers, please? Thank you. Uh, and if folks would, would help out on, uh, uh, on, on, on the notepad, uh, that would be helpful, especially during... Eric's presentation, I think. Should we go ahead and... Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as I said, this is HTTP. Um, we have on the agenda blue sheets, but that's largely uh, automated now. If you haven't already, please use the QR codes to check into the session with Data Tracker so we can track attendance in these sessions. Um, we have a scribe. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and if you're not aware of it by now, uh, uh, the terms and conditions of your participation here are on the note well, as we say. If you're not familiar with this, uh, look up IETF note well in your favorite internet search engine. This covers things like intellectual property, uh, anti-harassment, uh, behavioral uh, norms, things like that. And, and we do take it seriously here, so please be aware of that. 
Our agenda for today, uh, we're going to discuss two active drafts. Oops. Uh, we have uh, resumable uploads uh, from Marius, and then we have Template Connect TCP uh, from Ben, who's remote. Uh, we covered cache groups uh, in our session yesterday, so that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and then we're going to move on to other topics. Uh, we have two more presentations from Ben, uh, security considerations for opti optimistic use of HTTP upgrade and the reverse HTTP transport. Then we have Eric's presentation on secondary cert authentication of servers. Uh, and finally, we have a kind of a combined session on, on two proposals in, in that, that have a little bit of overlap one braid, which we've, we've talked about before, and one per resource event protocol. Uh, any agenda bashing that needs to take place? No? Okay, let's get into it then. Uh, first up, resumable uploads. There it is. Do you want to drive the slides or should I? Do you want me to drive the slides? Okay. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about resumable uploads, especially what has happened since the last ITF meeting, and then also discuss a few points that are currently on the agenda. Um, just a brief recap, resumable uploads, we try to make, um, or give clients the ability to resume an upload if a large pass re request with a large body was interrupted, um, just to make it everything a bit more reliable. Um, next slide, please. So we, had a hackathon project um, uh, for the first time at this ITF. Can I have the, um, ah, thank you. <laughs> right, uh, one project that we worked on was an automated server conformity checker. Basically, it's a suite of tests that is currently written in Python, and you can basically point it to your server, it will run a few tests that are based on the current draft specification, and then it will tell you, oh, there's a few violations with your implementation or you did everything correct. It's a handy tool to improve interoperability between different implementations, and it also just helps you to spot a few issues in your implementation. It could be a handy tool to run in your continuous integration pipeline, um, and we've also tried this out at the Agaton. Um, a lot of thanks to Piotrek uh, for working on this. There's also a GitHub um, repository if you wanna check it out. And Next slide, please. Um, here's a brief image or screenshot how it looks. Um, on the top right, you see a few green dots that indicate a few tests were successful, a few tests didn't fail. Um, for example, the server returned a wrong response, and that indicates that I have to fix up my implementations. Next slide, please. There was also another hackathon project where we tried to integrate resumable uploads into proxies. The idea is that proxies then can handle the resumable uploads without the application server ever having to handle them on their own. So for example, as you can see on the scheme below, the proxy will take care of handling the resumable upload requests, concatenating the data together, and once the upload is complete, it will then send it in a single request to the server, which is pretty handy. Um, then the server doesn't have to take care of all of this, and you can easily add it into existing applications. Um, Merlin was so kind and wrote a plugin for Keddy that works really well. I tried to do it for Nginx, but didn't get so far because I'm not good at C. Um, but this is, I think, a pretty interesting approach for some applications, but not for every application. Next slide, please. Um, just a brief recap what we did since the last draft. We published draft 02 um, shortly before the ITF meeting, and the changes since one are rather small, but still nice. We replaced the upload incomplete header with upload complete, just inversing the logic to avoid a double negative. And we also clarified um, how content length is ha handled, um, basically making sure that whenever the client tells the server how big the entire upload is, um, this information shouldn't change. It should always be consistent across requests. We also got a few editorial changes. Thanks a lot to Mark and Lucas for those. So the document is now a lot nicer to read and a lot more in line with HTTP in general. Next slide, please. So this brings me to what has happened in the past. Um, there's a few things that we would like to discuss here. Um, there's a few, 
four issues in total, one per slide, and I would just briefly like to go through them and then maybe ask you for comments um, if there's any. One of the biggest one that we are currently uh, faced with is the media type for the patch request. We use patch requests in order to append data to an upload, and the specification requires that patch requests have a media type so the server knows how to interpret the data in the body. We currently don't have one, so we need one. Um, there's a few options for this. Um, option one is in line with what we're currently doing in the draft, where we say we send a patch request. This patch request has a specific offset in a header field, and the body is just the data that you want to write to that offset or append in our case. This is really simple because you just take the request body, and for example, if you write it to a file, you just append it to the file. It's real simple, it's nice. But what would an appropriate media type be for that? We could say we use application octet stream because in the end, the body is just like a byte stream. If you don't really have to parse it, there's no additional information in it. But this also seems kind of odd because you're effectively reusing a media type that is the default media type. Um, so that might also be a bit confusing or problematic. We could also think about creating a new media type, for example, application slash offset plus octet stream which indicates the request body is just a byte stream without any special format, but it doesn't start at the beginning. It starts as a specific offset. That's why you have the offset plus in there. And this offset would then be specified in the request header field. So that would be one approach a bit more um, explicit. There's also another option um, in the HTTP API working group. There's currently a proposal about byte range patch with defines a message byte range media type. Um, it's a bit more complex. It's in itself an encapsulated patch document. Um, it in so the offset and the file data is actually included in the request body, meaning that you actually have to parse the request body to get the offset out compared to option one where the offset is inside a header field. It's a bit more complex, um, but that's another option. And maybe there's other options as well. I'm not sure if there's other existing media types that we could reuse for this. So is there any comments about from the audience about can we use a new media type for this or rather not? Uh, Jonathan. Hey, uh, Jonathan Flat, Apple. Um, I think that the byte range patch does have some interesting use cases, but I think that in the resumable uploads case, it adds some unneeded complexity. Uh, so I would be in favor of either one or three, uh, anything that keeps essentially the representation, just partial representation <coughs> in the body. Um, a lot of client and server APIs also uh, manage checking header fields or adding header fields first. and that would allow them not to have to modify the body, maybe make it simpler. Um, maybe option three could be like a partial put with the same content type as the original resource, um, but I'm not sure I prefer option one or three. Austin? Hi, Austin Wright of the uh, aforementioned byte range patch. Um, yeah, um, I have no problem if, like, uh, you not using a particular media type. If I've uh, suggested that the partial put might actually be um, appropriate here, which is specified in 9110. Um, and the only reason I actually published or proposed byte range patch was because of the case where you want to do a partial put and you don't know if the server supports it or not, in which case that could be corrupting or something. Um, but I don't think that's the case here. Uh, a partial put would probably be just fine. And that's essentially the same thing as doing a patch with what I suggested doing, like a, a patch with octet stream. Um, it should be the same thing. Um, if, if there's really a philosophic purpose to doing using the patch method instead of a partial put, um, great, like, <laughs> I support that. But um, in that case, I would, yeah, uh, option one um, seems good. Um, and also, 
Presumably, this patch is being applied to a resource that represents the upload body, in which case the server should be able to support a number of different media types for the patch, but we're just talking about the one that must be supported because we know there's going to be universal support for it. But in theory, there's no reason the server should reject other media types. Yes, that's a quite good point. There could also be other patch formats in the future or outside this draft. And I got on cue just to say, if you do take option one, the patch needs to be, the patch message needs to be self-describing. So application.getStream probably wouldn't do it because you've actually got an extra semantic here, which is pay attention to that header there. And so you probably do need a special media type for that. Understand that plus has a very specific meaning in media types. It introduces a suffix. So you probably wouldn't use that one on the screen, but we can get to that. Yeah, that's all I had to say, really. Austin. Yeah, I proposed using application.getStream for that. It's kind of hackish. My thought process was what else could octetStream possibly mean in a patch method other than saying this content is opaque binary data and it's part of a window. And in order to understand which window that is, you have to look at like the content range header. It's a hack. It only works in HTTP, but yeah. Yeah, but content range doesn't say it's for that purpose. So I'd rather be explicit. Anyway. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is also a bit of a um, bigger question that has arised since the last ITF meeting. Uh, basically, in HTTP, every request has a response. And for example, for uploads, this response might contain information that is extracted from the uploaded file. Now, in resumable uploads, it would be really handy if we could design them in a way that they are a transparent upgrade over regular uploads, which are not resumable. Um, the way how this could work is that you have a client and it uses a HTTP library to speak to the server. And the HTTP library can then decide if it wants to use resumable uploads under the hood to improve reliability or to recover from errors without the client actually knowing about this. This is a really handy approach to get resumable uploads deployed a bit more widely, um, depending on your application. But if we want to do that, there's a few questions about how do we handle responses. For example, the first question is the HTTP library has to provide a response to the client application. What should that response be? One approach is um, to simply say the last request that was sent by, this, by the client completed the upload. So at that point, the server had all of the data available that it needed. It could then process it in a certain application specific manner and generate a response. And this response would then also be the response that the HTTP library provides to the client. So effectively, you could use that approach that for the client, it doesn't know whether resumable uploads are used under the hood. It will just get a response back and it might not even know if it, the network was interrupted um, during the upload, which would be quite handy. But that also brings up a few of the questions or uh, opportunities, let's call it like that. For example, what happens if the client uploads all of the data, the server starts crunching on it um, and generates a response, but this response is never sent to the client because the network was interrupted at that time. We could then also say the client has the opportunity to like refetch the response by sending an empty patch request to the server. An empty patch request wouldn't modify the upload resource because it's already completed. And the server could just say, okay, I'm gonna respond with the same response that I've generated before, allowing the client to effectively fetch again the response. And this also brings a third question up. Um, what, for example, happens if we receive a 500 status code? Does that mean the upload should be retried because the server wasn't able to store the data? Does that mean the server was not able to process the file after the upload is complete? And resuming won't help? Should we have to 
like distinguish between those two cases or say, whatever, retry for a few times. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, happy for any input here. Uh, uh, I'd say that here we are not trying to create a long running transaction protocol. HTTP as it is, isn't for that purpose. And considering that reasonable upload is about just fixing the failure, one particular failure mode of HTTP, we don't need to do something more than HTTP that already. I'd probably say that if the server sends an error, that's an error, and let the client do whatever it wants. And yeah. I, I think that'd be fine. And I got into queue, I think, to say something complimentary to what Kazuha has said, which is there's a decision to be made here as to whether we're trying to model this in terms of, of uh, a resource state, you know, the, the abstractions that HTTP provides, or trying to provide fidelity down to the message level. And if we're trying to provide that, you know, fidelity to the message level, that's quite difficult, especially because we're using HTTP high level constructs to do this. But if you're just trying to model this in terms of resource state, then it's, well, you do a get to the resource. It has a representation. We've got tools like content location. There's ways to compose this in a way that are reasonable, but, but the application has to do that. Um, if you're trying to paper over everything and pretend that this is the real response from the resource, that's a much higher bar, and I don't know if we can actually reach it. So, for whatever that's worth. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Flat. Uh, I guess echoing a bit of what Kazuo and Mark said, um, I think the client should probably be able to decide what it wants to do in response to something like a 500 status code. Um, maybe retry a certain number of times, but I don't know if we need to specify that. Uh, for number two, I think that if it misses the response for some reason, maybe a timeout, maybe the connection was interrupted, any reason like that, I think instead of just sending an empty patch request, the client should uh, try to do offset retrieving again and maybe get the upload offset of the complete resource at which point it then sends the patch request um, and hopefully retrieves the final response. Yes, that, that would be the way how that would work, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Austin. Austin, Austin right? Um, yeah, uh, treating long running um, operations for, on the server is something I would love to treat eventually. And actually, that's sort of what got me into doing the byte range patch. Um, but that is sort of a different thing entirely. Um, for getting the, what, what if the client, for number two, what if the client misses the response there? Um, my understanding is the content location header does exactly this. It's providing the URL of the document that's in the response to the request. Um, and you could even provide that in a 103 early hints. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, John Lennox, I feel like some of these questions are asked with the intention of the hackathon project you mentioned where a proxy can transparently uh, turn a resumable upload into a non-resumable upload, but I feel like that's probably not in general possible without the proxy knowing something about the application semantics because obviously things like you would really rather not um, you know, do the whole upload and then discover the application server says, no, you're not allowed to upload here. So um, I feel like that probably there needs to be more coordination between the proxy and the application server if you're gonna do that, you tend to do pure transparent things. At which point, some of these can be application logic, not just generic. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, <coughs> implementing this on a proxy level would also impose a few limitations and make it all at work not as seamless as if you integrate it directly into your application. That's correct. All right, thank you very much for uh, the responses on the response question. And then let's move on to the next one. Um, so this is a rather smallish thing. Um, at the last ITF, we talked about using informational responses in order to carry information about the upload progress from the server to the client. Um, and there was concept or interest in um, getting this uh, or using this. Um, and now we have a proposal for this. Uh, it basically looks like the 
um, responds, it's a bit smallish. Um, it looks like uh, the exchange on the bottom slide. Um, so you, for example, the client sends a post request and it says, I'm going to upload 100 bytes. And then the server says, OK, that's great. If you want to resume, use the following URL. And then it can regularly send those 104 upload resumption supported informational responses. And those include upload offsets telling, for example, in this case, hey, I uploaded or I safely stored 50 bytes, indicating to the client that the client can forget this data. It doesn't have to keep it in buffer or in memory or on disk anymore because it already is completely safe on the server. The rest of the response is just uh, the final end of the upload. Um, and that um, is a pretty nice pattern. There's a few questions around which headers should be necessary in the 104, if we make upload offset mandatory in every 104, or if we rather say, just do it if you have some information. There were also some questions on GitHub about whether location should be mandatory in every 104, basically repeating the location over and over in case that one information response gets lost. I'm not sure is there any um, feedback on that proposal. Uh, Kazuho, in general, I think sending the offset is fine. I, I'm not sure the clients can rely on that to, re to release memory, but and going to the point of uh, proxies dropping the in informational responses, I'm not that allowed in the spec. It should be never one says that every informational response has to be forwarded by the proxy. That's my assignment. So in general, I think doing this is safe. Um, if we are to allow lo multiple location headers to be sent, probably we have to consider what we need to do when the values are different. But maybe that's all. Hey, Lucas Pardew, Cloudflare. Um, yeah, Kazuo commented on the issue. I think my memory was tainted by something. I don't, maybe like 103 early hints, because they're just a hint. and. Well, technically, the proxy like has to forward them. If it didn't, then it kind of doesn't matter because the final thing would override the hint or something like that. So I'm not saying that's the right design model. The RFC 9110 is very clear on what the proxy should do, and we can't necessarily police that. Um, but yeah, I was I was wrong. So thanks, Kazira. Uh, Jonathan Black, um, I think. Uh, Echoing something I think I read on the issue, what would be nice about also including the location header in these subsequent uh, 104 responses is that if one happens to get dropped some for some reason, um, you can still figure out where to resume. In that case, from like a future one. In that case, though, I think we should enforce that all of the location uh, header field values are the same. Yeah, I think that was the brought up that if one of those informational responses is lost somehow, that if you send it again, then the client can still resume and retrieve the location. And that's the point where I'm not really sure if that's a common scene in deployed infrastructure, that you lose one informational response, but the next one will get through. I'm not sure if that might also be depending on the HTTP version that's used. Just my response, I, that feels like premature optimization, maybe, or over-engineering. I, I don't see that as a likely scenario. And if, if it happens, then there are much worse things happening, probably. <laughs> Lucas? Yeah, yeah. just just to kind of echo Mark, I think, yeah, let's not over-index on that bit. I think my comment on the ticket was more like, you're either going to get all of them or none of them. And the model we have would work with either of those scenarios. The thing in the middle where you get some or not, eh, no. Like, if you're doing that, then you've got your own problems and you need to sort your stuff out. There might be somebody using a client-side tool that, that doesn't expose an API for 1xx, but that's their problem. They'll know about it. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, a last one um, of the bigger ones about interoperability with HTTP Digest. The idea is at the last ITFs, there were also expressed interest that we use checksums to verify the integrity of uploads. 
And basically the client could say, hey, I have computed this checksum for the file. And then the server can, after the upload, verify if the checksums match, um, which is, for some applications, pretty important. Um, there is now the questions about if we, well, if we, that's probable, if in the draft for resumable uploads, we should explicitly mention how interoperability with the digests work. For example, if the client includes a digest in a patch request, but that patch request is interrupted in the middle, then the respond or the request body that was received by the server doesn't match with the digest because it didn't receive all of the data. Should we in those cases say, okay, the server should reject it, reject the data because it wasn't able to verify the checksum? Should that be behavior be application dependent? Because the digest draft, as far as I know, doesn't, imp or doesn't uh, specify rules on what should be done if um, checksums don't match. So yeah, that's a bit of question like, should we specify this? Should we leave it out? Yes, please. Yeah, Lucas Pardew again. Uh, so there was a discussion on the mailing list. I think Rob uh, raised it, and that was a while back. To my, it's my mind we should just like mention that integrity can help, but it's not needed. Um, we should definitely punt this up again. It doesn't need to be discussed in this draft. If you want to develop a a service that uses resumable uploads, and you want to describe a profile of HTTP that makes that service works particularly well. And, and things great, but you know, if, if a patch fails halfway through, there's there's other ways you can see that where you know, like you would have the content length of the patch and know that the bytes didn't work. We we don't want to explain all of HTTP in this document, so I think I'm voting for do nothing more than just mention the possibility that you could do this, and even that is maybe not required. But I can prepare the text. I, I volunteered to do that already. I just forgot. So. We'll make a PR and we can, we can review and see what people feel. All right, thank yeah. you very much. Just just to add to that, um, yeah, generally our philosophy is to, to, to describe the components and, and allow people to compose them, not to have tight relationships between them. <laughs> All right, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. So this is the last slide. Um, the things that I brought up are just like a bit of the bigger things that we would like to figure out soon. Uh, there's also other open issues. Um, there's a bit of discussion about should we handle errors during the upload creation a bit better? Um, also recovering from mail errors there. Um, but we also have another smallish issue about allowing the 200 status code for offset retrieval. Currently, we only allow uh, 204, but why shouldn't we allow 200 as well? Um, there doesn't seem to be much downsides to that. We have also brought this up to the uh, What Working Group to see if there's interest in implementing this into browsers, but there hasn't been much going on. But if there's any comments on those, um, feel free to answer. If not, that's the presentation about resumable uploads. Any, any other comments about this one? Okay. I just wanted to say uh, both thank you and congratulations for having uh, uh, tests and for doing that work. That is so important and unfortunately unusual. So other draft authors take note. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, now we begin the Ben Schwartz show coming to you in three parts. Okay. Hey everybody, uh, great. This is Connect TCP, next slide. Just in case you have forgotten about Connect TCP, uh, here's the quick reminder. This is uh, HTTP Connect in the style of Connect UDP, but for TCP. Uh, so the proxy is identified by a template and that template generates a request uh, with a scheme and an authority and a path. Uh, next slide. Uh, we had a long discussion at IETF 117 uh, related to some fun questions about HTTP upgrade security, but we're going to talk about that later. Um, the closely related to that was a discussion of optimistic content sending 
Um, so there have been a couple of changes in the draft text related to that. But the actual technical content in terms of like interoperability has not changed. Um, I think this is ready for working group last call. Uh, next slide. This is the entire diff between uh, between Dash 01 and Dash 02. Uh, basically, like control and you know control F find and replace um, false start with optimistic and uh, a few other adjustments about how the draft talks about uh, early data and the too early response there. Um, that is all the changes between these draft versions. Uh, and I should say that these changes are, are largely editorial, clarifying the rules here. All right, any questions, thoughts on this? David. David Skenazi, Connect Enthusiast. Um, so I followed an issue, I put it on GitHub four days ago, but no worries if you haven't seen it yet. Um, would it make sense to have a default template the way we did for Connect UDP and Connect IP? I think it would kind of be nice to mirror those and have like for the same reasons that we put it there, I think it would be good to put it here. So the, the reason I didn't do that was that if, uh, if you don't have a template, we already have a uh, a default way to to do TCP proxying, which is using standard HTTP connect. Uh, so if I if you're in the situation where you only have the a host name or authority to go on, um, you're all set for connect TCP. So it's not obvious to me that a default template provides additional utility there. But if you think it's certainly easy to define. So if you think that there's value in it, we can do it. So my thinking would be that in a world where we're building kind of these new proxies like uh, Apple's private relay, Chrome's IP protection, where we're setting up these things and uh, as I like to call it, mask all the things, it, it would be nice to kind of have those things all, all together the, the, the same way. And that way, if we have that, we can kind of completely get rid of legacy connect for uh, and that like wire format spelling completely. So I not like, this isn't crazy, but that would be my preference personally. So so my preference here, I'm, I don't object to the default template per se, but my preference for those systems would be to say they should be configured by a URI template. That URI template should have all of the parameters needed for connect TCP and connect UDP and maybe connect IP. That's all just one URI template. And you know, at the point that you're stuffing a string through an API boundary, that string is now this URI template. Oh, that's a fair point. All right, let me think about it a little bit more. All right, I added myself next. Um, so I have one comment uh, on that discussion in favor of having the well-known template. Um, while I agree, Ben, with your point, um, I think for future things we could do with this, such as the pattern we see in the connect, like the, the work that's going on in mask for having a, like a listener mode of connect UDP, it like essentially uses the default well-known URI template and replaces it with like a star star. And I'm interested in, you know, seeing a similar thing for like a TCP listen proxy which you know, we, we shouldn't be doing in here, but it would leverage and like would work well in the ecosystem of connect TCP. And that's clearly a case where you're not gonna have, like uh, the standard yield connect proxy will not support that. And so this still provides a default location for it. But okay, I definitely need to think about that a little bit more. Sure, um, you can take that to the issue. The other question I had more for chairing purposes, as you're saying around last call and the relationship with the optimistic upgrade, I, I, I'd have to double check 
is there a particular document relationship between this and that? I know that this one's safe on its own, but like, is it something where we'd want to at least adopt that other work maybe before going to last call on this one to make sure- As it stands, the there is no relationship between the documents. Okay. Um, okay. So I no, would be no comfortable, reference. I would be comfortable moving them independently. Okay, thank you. I'm Mike Bishop, Akamai. I just wanted to point out, remind everyone that one of the reasons that we want this is because Legacy Connect doesn't allow you to specify the host that you're trying, the host name of the proxy as part of the request. And I think having that default template, and Legacy Connect is not a useful fallback for those of us who need the host name to route the request properly and know whether we are a proxy on this request or not. Mm -hmm. And so having that default template might be helpful. That's a better that's okay, nice. that, that seems like a, a pretty strong argument. Eric, another plus, another plus one for a default template so we can get Legacy Connect to go away. David Skenazi. Um, I, I was looking on the GitHub. There was like, the, there's a second open issue which was opened by Kazuo about origin, and it actually ties into this conversation a little bit, which is um, the so the original HTTP spec is really not clear about what the origin is when you're talking to a proxy. Like it, there kind of isn't one, and so. Uh, in particular because there's no scheme. Um, and so then when you like, so you get into weird situations when like you receive alt service on your connect response and you're like, oh, but what origins does that apply to? I, I, okay, I'm just gonna pretend it's HTTPS. I think it might be unfair to ask you to fix all that mess here, um, but it might actually be useful to have that discussion of saying like here ex explicitly in this document what the origin is there and maybe discuss uh, as part of the motivation for this document why that's a, an improvement over the, ori the original connect. Yeah, that's uh, in the list of, you know, talking points, reasons to do this somewhere at the top of the document. Um, that's a that's another one that we could add. Uh, Yaroslav. Uh, Yaroslav from Soma Jose Scaler. Um, in traditional connect, uh, there is actually a way to specify proxy origin that is used by some services if that connect happens to be wrapped in the TLS, so-called HTTPS. Uh, proxy so that can be the proxy host name can be derived from SNI. Um, perhaps it could be mentioned in the in the draft as an option for implementers that want a fallback mechanism to traditional connect. I uh, I am inclined to avoid talking about SNI here. I think that this specification lives entirely essentially within the HTTP specifications. And to the extent that HTTP has anything to say about SNI, that's really kind of uh, something that happens in a separate layer. And, and, and Ben, just to be clear, um, you're currently not updating 9110, correct? Correct, there's, yes, this, this draft does not update anything. Because as soon as you start talking about the semantics of connect, you're gonna need to go there. Anything else on this one or should we move on? Okay, so I think we are now done with all of our active drafts. We're gonna move on to various proposals starting with the one we were just talking about. An optimistic upgrade, okay, here we go. Go ahead Ben. Okay, hello. Uh, so, as I just mentioned, um, 
Connect TCP in HTTP 1.1 makes use of HTTP upgrade. Um, it copies that, it copies and pastes that almost verbatim from Connect UDP. Uh, but in the course of looking at this, I realized that there were some, some issues uh, that, that were raised here. So uh, in Connect TCP especially, it's, it would have been easy to design this in such a way that there were request smuggling attacks where a user of the proxy could impersonate the client to the proxy. Uh, and if you want, we can talk about in more detail exactly what that was. We talked about this in, at some length in, in IATF 117. Um, in the, so in Connect TCP, I think we've avoided that in a straightforward way, but uh, also it turns out that Connect UDP, which is already published RFC, uh, is hypothetically vulnerable to similar attacks um, only under certain conditions that are not currently true. So uh, this prompted a broader discussion of uh, what are the rules for how to make a secure upgrade protocol in HTTP 1.1? <clears throat> and are there, are there things that you're not allowed to do? Um, and there seemed like to be some interest in the working group on this. So I drew up a document and tried to uh, figure out the state of affairs. So, um, so this is a zero zero. And I just want to highlight a couple things from this draft. Uh, so this is a document exploring the security implications of optimistic transmission in conjunction with HTTP upgrade. That's the case where you're talking to the server, you start an upgrade, you send an upgrade request. And before you found out whether or not that upgrade succeeded, you say, I think it's going to succeed and I'm going to start sending payload. Uh, as if the upgrade has already succeeded. Uh, and this, this document is really about interest in, uh, interesting interactions between that and attacker controlled data in that, uh, in that upgrade payload uh, and how that enables potential request smuggling and parser exploits. Next. So I, I went through and analyzed the existing upgrade tokens from the IANA registry. And basically they all seem to happen to dodge this, this issue either very explicitly on purpose or uh, a little bit sort of ambiguously, but, but sort of obviously enough, except Connect UDP, which I think needs a slight alteration uh, and so this draft updates Connect UDP uh, as highlighted, uh, basically disabling the optimistic behavior in, in HTTP 1.1, uh, which it should be said, you know, Connect UDP over HTTP 1.1 is a pretty sad state of affairs anyway. So um, making that marginally slower is, is maybe not a big deal. Uh, so yeah, everything else seems to be okay. Connect IP has uh, already been updated to match this guidance. So, uh, so it's clear. Next. Uh, I just figured I would copy and paste this whole section out of the, out of the draft. Um, so this is design guidance for people who are creating new upgrade tokens here. It's, you know, it, it's a note, it's an IETF note to self. Um, and so I figured that probably people will have opinions about whether these are good guidance, whether there are other good practices that we should be recommending or whether we should be prioritizing some of these over others. Uh, that's that's basically the, the only, that's the most novel thing in the, in the draft, I think. Next slide. So uh, I, this draft is seeking adoption here. And uh, if I remember right, I think the other slides are more details about the attacks in case anybody wants to really go through the details. Next, uh, so let's um, go to questions. Okay, um, first up is Lucas. 
Hey, Lucas Pardew, uh, there are no questions. This is good work. Thanks, Ben. I think we should adopt this document and just get it get it done. Maybe, maybe some issues around scoping of exactly how much guidance is enough guidance and whatever, but we can just figure that out in this group. Cheers. Thanks. And, and I'll note this is not a new topic for us. We did discuss it last time. There did this seem, seem to be a fair amount of enthusiasm, just a desire for a bit more detail, which I think we've seen here. Um, what do you, uh, any, oh, Mike, please. Oh, yes, we have a queue now. Mike Bishop, definitely support adoption here. Um, I think this is good work. Thank you again for finding this, Ben. Uh, I will point out that the pointing to the example of H2C for upgrade, that that is now deprecated behavior as of 91.13. So maybe we can point to it as having been a good design pattern that was used, but is no longer in, in active use. Uh, thank you for this work. This has to be adopted to fix the issue in Connect UDP, I think. And regarding the mitigations, I kind of think that we, 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 can, we can just be fine by saying that don't do this in HTTP 1.1 because we are not interested in optimizing it anymore. David Skenazi, enthusiastic about this. Please adopt. Short and sweet. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Lennox, you mentioned, and I saw your slides, that you, you need to, in order to, for the problem to exist with Connect UDP, you need certain capsule types. Is it worth putting a restriction on the capsule type registry to not collide with ASCII names of HTTP requests? So uh, first of all, sorry, I dropped out and I missed Kazuho's entire comment. Um, the uh, so what the draft does is to say, uh, just don't send optimistically for Connect UDP and HTTP 1.1. Just wait to find out if the upgrade succeeded. Um, so we don't need that restriction um, because we have this other restriction. We could have done it the other way, as you say, and uh, and of course, you know, the the group is, if it adopts the draft, is free to make that change. But I think this is probably the right approach. David Skenazi, uh, cap, capsule registry designated expert. Um, Not enthusiastic. Also enthusiastic <laughs> about capsules, obviously. Um, I really agree, I strongly agree with Ben here. I think this is a much better solution. I would really be strongly against reserving capsules and doing the work to see what binary <laughs> numbers look at what methods. It's just a, it's absolute madness. Uh, shall we try the show of hands tool? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So then, then we can just confirm on the list. Sure. So um, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I think the question is, oh, Alan, did you have a comment? I'm a humming enthusiast. I know. Aren't we all? You, you are allowed to hum while you click the show of hands tool. No one will stop you. <laughs> oh, good. And I shall. <laughs> so I think the question is, um, Let's just say interest in adoption, and um, yes sure. means you support adoption. Do you support adoption? Do, do you support adoption? Yeah, uh, and no means uh, you do not support adoption. And if you don't click either, then you don't care. You don't care. You're in business, yeah. which is okay too. And in, and we will ask if if there are no's, we'll ask give them the opportunity to come up and explain why. So, okay, uh, the poll is running. You may hum. That'll be our background music for the night. Oh, that's lovely. So we have uh, so far 31 yes, one no, and 36, uh, 32, one, 36. Uh, let's give it a few more seconds. Oh, I should probably, oh, no, I won't. There we go. All right, I'm going to stop it. Positivity, positivity almost beat ambivalence today, but not quite. Almost. Yeah, oh wait, no, no, we oh, did it, we did it, we did it. <laughs> Thanks for pushing us across the line. What a, what a rare occurrence in 2020. Hi there, hi there. All right. Okay, uh, so that was 35 yeses, one no, and uh, 32 no opinion. Uh, if the person uh, who said no uh, would like to uh, get up and say why, that, that, that's great. Uh, 
obviously if, if they don't, that's cool too. And if they want to come and talk to Tommy and I afterwards and explain, that's equally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll take this as input and I think we'll, we'll do a call for an option on, formally on the list yeah. okay. and uh, see where it goes. Very good. Thank you, Ben. But don't go anywhere. Stay right here. Uh, Kazuho, again, I missed your whole comment. So if you want to follow up afterwards, feel free. Okay. Um, so, and now for something completely different. Um, this is a, a, a brand new weird idea um, with now several authors um, called reverse HTTP transport, but I just call it reverse HTTP. So next slide. So there's this thing from Cloudflare. I have no affiliation with Cloudflare. None of, as far as I know, none of the co-authors do. Um, but there's this thing uh, from Cloudflare called Cloudflare Tunnel. Uh, and basically it says like, you can put a Mac mini under your TV and then it can be a web server even if it's not reachable from the internet. Uh, next slide. And the way that works is if you follow the directions of the arrows, somebody is trying to reach your website so they talk to cloudflare and then your server actually also itself acts as a client talking to cloudflare and an attacker can't reach your server directly because your server like doesn't exist on the public internet next slide cloudflare is not the only uh large company that has ended up deciding that they need something like this um so this is an exa uh, a slide from SAP Cloud Connector, which uh, is actually, uh, SAP is actually a SAP, I don't know, is actually the uh, employer of one of the co-authors. So Cloud Connector is, uh, again, a, a similar idea, but here in a, in a much more complex enterprise use case where you have some sort of, in this case, some daemons may be on-premise behind a firewall, some in some sort of, maybe firewalled private cloud setup. And again, they want to be able to effectively um, act as servers, but as a transport matter, they're only clients. Next slide. So yeah, what are these things? Um, so in HTTP terms, I think, I think about this as the origin server is not externally accessible as a transport server. That could be because it's behind a firewall. That could be because it's like mobile. Its IP address is changing over time. Uh, we can think of other reasons maybe. Um, and so the origin server instead acts as a transport client to reach, uh, I'm calling this the query source. So that could be literally the, the actual HTTP client or more likely, in, and the draft uses this terminology, it could be an intermediary. Uh, most commonly, probably a reverse proxy, like in the Cloudflare tunnel case. So like, okay, but why not just like punch a hole in the firewall so that only your, um, so that only your trusted your, the client or intermediary you're trying to reach can reach you? Um, like that is kind of the, the mostly state of the art here, but configuring firewalls out of band is pretty complicated and everything has to stay the same. Your, your origin server can't move, your, uh, your intermediary can't change the IPs that it's using to reach you. Uh, and also, if your attack is just like a massive flood that's gonna just totally saturate your link, then the firewall isn't gonna help you. They can just basically overwhelm your firewall. Uh, Ted? Uh, Ted Hardy, uh, middle back, middle box, and middle box services observer. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you have somehow avoided uh, managing to talk to anybody who vends firewalls in a very long time. If this is your view of what firewalls can and can't do, uh, there are people who do cloud-based firewall services that have elastic compute and do all of this management of volumetric attacks. There are um, uh, firewalls that do far more complicated things than, than what you assert that they are doing in terms of managing where the origins are or managing where the Anycast services distributing the firewalls are, et cetera. I think you should make your argument for this uh, completely disjoint from what you think some other service does because your view of that other service is possibly a little bit uh, old fashioned. Okay. 
uh, <clears throat> noted. Um, next slide. Um, so the other question that I, th I think is sort of clear here is why, why should we standardize something like this? Um, because after all, we have these proprietary protocols um, and they're doing what they're doing. You know, they're serving however many, however many users they're serving. Um, I think there are some notable limitations uh, with the current ecosystem. Uh, so right now, basically the way this works is your cloud provider or essentially the, whoever you're talking to provides you with a daemon, which is like a software package that you have to run on your side. Uh, so there, there are not multiple interoperable implementations. There's just a, a you know, an executable. If, if you're lucky, maybe you can get source code uh, provided by, by your cloud provider. And so that's, that can be an integration challenge if you're trying to like manage containers and, and a complex service system, it, it's nice to be able to choose your software. Um, migration or, you know, supporting mobility in the sense that people should be able to switch from one provider to another one without having to re-architect or, uh, you know, change what software they're running. And protocol evolution. So, you know, these protocols haven't necessarily kept up with all of the latest HTTP features, and, and certainly there's no reason to expect they will going forward because they're not maintained alongside HTTP. Uh, I believe that the state of the art here is that they are built over WebSockets, for what it's worth. Next slide. Another interesting category of reasons, and I think the real reason that we felt it was a time to write this draft was because of the emergence of what I'm calling large scale proxies. I'm thinking here to some extent about things like Apple Private Relay, but also about efforts that uh, I sort of hear about from other browser vendors who also want to um, potentially offer all of their users a, a proxy infrastructure that they can share. And one of the interesting things about those proxy systems is that they uh, probably should to some extent block large scale attacks uh, like DDoS attacks. You shouldn't, it should be difficult to run a DDoS attack through one of these proxy systems. And so there are different architectures you can imagine. You can imagine an origin saying, I'm going to create a copy of my whole stack for each of these, uh, each of these proxies. And then uh, if somebody runs a DDoS attack against my main origin, which is huge and over provisioned to handle these loads, you know, at least the copies that are uh, behind these large scale proxies, those copies will stay up because those proxies either aren't under attack or are handling those attacks themselves. Or another version of this is like, I have a DDoS defense system. Maybe I'm already using uh, a reverse, a, a, this kind of reverse connection pattern. Um, but I don't want to have to pay the cost of my uh, of traffic running through this DDoS defense layer when it, it's going through one of these large scale proxies, which is already effectively providing that service. Next slide. Uh, so this is a, an overview of the proposed protocol. This is just a sort of placeholder, I think. But the, the point of this is to say that it's just standard HTTP, but with the roles reversed, um, which does mean that we had to do some tricks with, um, with client certificates, because the client certificate is the thing that certifies the origin. And you need an origin frame, basically, because you don't have an SNI. Uh, but those are things that exist. We didn't have to invent them. Um, maybe I'll stop here for a second. Lucas? Uh, if you, are you done, Ben, or do you want to finish? Uh, I think, well, uh, OK, if you want to, we can, we can. Uh, yeah, I can wait. Yeah. So there are, this is pretty early work. Um, there are a bunch of questions here about what we actually need. And uh, there's some text here. There, there's particularly some issues where I, I think we really haven't quite found the right answer. Um, but I'm interested to hear what the working group thinks and uh, what direction this should go.
Go ahead, Lucas. Okay, Lucas, uh, a standards enthusiast. I think, like you say, there's lots of people who are doing this kind of thing. Cloudflare Tunnel is an example. I work with Cloudflare, but I don't work on that team, uh, so I can't speak for them or that product or anything like that. But um, creating a, a standard for what lots of people are doing seems like a sensible thing to me. The, the part about proxies and DDoS, I'm not quite sure, because there's DDoS is like a term for lots of different stuff. So some of those proxies will only tunnel, like we talked about, you know, transport layer things. Layer 4 DDoS is very different from humongous layer 7s. I don't think we need to get into that detail right now, but I, I didn't just quite follow what some of the motivations for that was presenting. Um, but I'll go off and think some more on that. Uh, specific design details. Yeah, we could figure that one out. Like, I'm interested. I don't know if this is near where we might want to think about adopting it yet. Another draft revision or two might help answer some of the questions I have. But uh, like I say, interesting work. Thanks. Uh, David Skenazi, tunneling weird stuff over HTTP enthusiast. <laughs> um, so th this, re this reminds me of a conversation I had with Christian Ritma in the very early days of MASK of like, once we got to talking about, you know, putting weird things over HTTP, one of his, Christian's ideas was he called it the hidden server, where it was very similar here. A client that would talk to a innocuous intermediary, and then other clients would talk to that intermediary, send the request down to the hidden server. Very similar. Um, and we thought about it. And you could implement that with uh, masks. So you need like connect UDP listen. You, you need a few tweaks on top of it to how you need the client and the uh, like, let's call it the mass server, uh, agree on connection IDs and stuff like that. Uh, if you wanted to do it for TCP, you would need some variant of connect TCP and then would need to you know, sniff SNI to fix support multiple. Again, but the important property there is that you would do funky things at the proxying layer, but then the top level protocol would be unmodified. This proposal instead modifies the top level protocol. And what worries me there is that the draft says, and we do H3 with the roles reversed. Um, there are about a queue of dragons that goes out the door in terms of how hard that's going to be because what you're effectively proposing is to keep the transport layer, let's say TLS, in the same client system, model, client server model, but take the application layer and reverse it. They're really tightly coupled, especially in Quick, with like saving settings with your RTT. So you can't just flip one and not the other. I'm not saying that doing this is impossible, but you're going to find that it's going to be incredibly difficult to hit all of those cases and get it right. So my personal take is that if we feel like solving this problem, I would prefer to solve it at the proxying layer, personally. Uh, <clears throat> OK, uh, I, we have a long queue. I'll just note that a lot of the solutions that, that take that form do end up with essentially double encryption, or, or two layers of HTTP, or two layers of, of TLS. Um, that might be OK, but something to consider. <laughs> So Kazuho, I, I, I echo what Lucas said. Uh, there are real use cases for these kind of things, and I'd be happy to see this adopted. That said, uh, there are currently limits to this uh, design if we consider large-scale deployments that you've mentioned. And that is that the endpoint is being identified by the FQDN, as indicated by the SNI. And the, pro and the authentication method is tied to the certificates, which is pretty inflexible. So I kind of wonder if we could use a extended connect method to create this tunnel, because then we can use URI as the endpoint and can use any authentication scheme that HTTP supports for this purpose. Interesting. Right now, this is bound to TLS client certificate authentication for the origin. And uh, it sounds like you're suggesting that maybe we should consider uh, 
other ways to authenticate the the origin. Right. Um, so from the service point point of view, if we, once we send two hundred, we just start using H two over there, and call it a day. So it's pretty simple, and it, it becomes much more flexible for large scale and de deployments. Just Interesting. I I think I definitely would need to to think about that a lot a lot more, especially to understand how you uh, convince the intermediary that you are the origin that you're claiming. Yep. Also, the is needed, but yes, thank you. Just a warning, we're going to be closing the queue fairly soon. Uh, Ted Hardy again, scope creep enthusiast. Oh, wait, what I meant to scope creep skeptic. Uh, that was right. Uh, in the uh, chat, I have put a pointer for you uh, for a system that was built in 2000 that does pretty much what you're talking about, because this actually goes back a lot further than it seems like you recognize. And that's important because there are a bunch of different variations which have happened over the way. And there's been a huge amount of kind of adaptive radiation in this space for how people do this. Um, and I think you, know, you probably know from your experience at Google, you could look at a GFE and say, the GFE is one of these things. Or you could say, no, no, that's a completely different thing because the kinds of origins it's talking to um, are different because some of them are straight up not HTTP. Well, it's an interesting question. I think the hardest thing you're going to actually have to do here is to write down exactly what's in scope and out of scope when you reverse these roles of HTTP and, and behave in this way. You could, in fact, say this is just for proxies talking to origins, uh, in which case you probably need, as you suggest, to have a different way of indicating it's not standard HTTP, although frankly, your request for a new URI scheme caused the hairs on the back of my head to go, what, please stop, no, don't. Um, I would actually say you need a boff, honestly. If this were a dispatch group, I would say you need a boff because the scope of work you're taking on uh, is either extremely large or very narrow, depending on what the charter says, not depending on what this current document restricts you to. And I think you're going to have to do the work uh, to figure out what the appetite of the community is for that scope anyway. Uh, so you might as well do it the normal way and take it to a ball. Alex? Hi, Alex Chernohovsky, Google. Um, while I'm interested in this draft in theory, I'm a little bit worried about a couple aspects of it. Um, to echo what David said, I'm definitely concerned about the role reversal and the effects that it has. But I think I have a more pragmatic concern, which is that I've definitely seen this particular use case desired. Like internally at Google, we have a cloud IAM proxy offering thing. And we have gotten people asking, how do I go and connect my enterprise VM on-premises thing to this cloud IAM proxy? I don't want to punch a hole in my firewall. So like the use case I think is very well motivated. But the problem with all of those things is that the, the, the appliance is usually an HTTP 1.1 speaker at best. And unless I'm misunderstanding the proposal here, this is an H2 or later technology, <coughs> which means that not only are you reversing the roles of these things, you also need an HTTP 2 to 1.1 protocol translator, which admittedly is not that hard. We have plenty of those. But like now suddenly the deployability of this thing, particularly if you're talking to some uh, you know, late 90s appliance that they want to protect, comes into question, right? Because you're now introducing all of these new features and you're translating it down to something that works and trying to use this thing. My other concern is we're basically building a VPN for HTTP. We have VPNs. Why not use the mask technology stack in order to solve this class of problem? because then we don't have to flip how we treat client and server on their head. Um, if the premise here is that there are existing technologies such as Cloudflare Tunnel, which provide this as a service, and we don't really know the specific implementation details, I don't really know if it makes sense to standardize the same technique without necessarily like a working implementation, right? I think if there was a person from one of those teams that has one of these things that was saying, here's how this works, we've already worked the edge cases, like we're, we're proposing to start here as the basis for the IETF, I think it would make much more sense, but otherwise I'm a little bit nervous about the scope and everything else we're doing here. And I would kind of encourage we consider finding a way to bridge the technology gap with a less invasive solution. Yeah. 
Hello, Austin Wright. Um, I've done some research in the area of HTTP over mesh networks, and um, it turns out H1 and H2 can send requests and responses from both clients and servers. They can talk to each other, and this is not ambiguous. Um, I'm not actually sure there needs to be any specification, not even like a new ALPS identifier. Um, uh, there might be some issues, like maybe TLS. I haven't looked at that, but there's still TLS client certificates for identifying the, the origin. Um, or maybe um, congestion control, like what if the, the single connection going to the reverse gateway what is congested? Can, how does the, the origin know to open up new connections? But you know, maybe those things need standardization, but um, th this is actually unambiguous in H1 and H2. I haven't looked at H3. That's fascinating. Um, I, uh, at a minimum, you're going to need an opt-in, right? You need some kind of signal that says, I'm not trying to connect to you as a client. Like, I'm actually a server. Uh, so I want you to send requests to me, and here's who I am, and I can prove it. Um, yeah, you wouldn't want to accidentally connect to the wrong or, or what you think is an origin, and it actually starts making requests of you, but uh, most web browsers will just abort the connection at that point because they, like, they don't know. But yeah, um, yeah, you... The, the other thing is with H2, some implementations um, assume that the odd numbers are always requests. That's not actually true. It just identifies the client, but you can still use odd numbers in requests or responses. Okay. Well, uh, I'll keep, we'll keep that in mind, especially for this question about bidirectional multiplexing, which I think goes, is exactly about that. Michael Tumum, a uh, distributed web enthusiast. And I, uh, I, I think this is really exciting. Personally, I'm also connected to a group that might not frequent IETF as much, which is more of the uh, distributed web uh, hobbyists or hackers. And um, they would really like this for a different set of use cases than Cloudflare, which is serving a website from your phone, even to uh, like a web, uh, a web server that's in your, uh, in your, your company or in your home, uh, like a small scale thing. Um, the advantage there is that your phone can go offline or reconnect in different places, and, but it can still hold the data. And then the proxy can exist to serve that. And that's a case where you certainly do want standards because you're not gonna have a giant company running that little proxy. Um, and uh, this also um, uh, connects with what I'm gonna be presenting in a little bit uh, about a, a state synchronization um, and more of a peer-to-peer -peer web. Uh, if you have the state synchronization technology, then it's okay for your phone to go offline and you can, the proxy can even mutate state on behalf uh, of, of multiple clients, and then your phone can come back on and serve and, and serve as an authority where, when it needs to. Um, so there are a broader yeah, range of yeah. use cases for this um, for in the, in the small scale that I want to point out for offline use. All right. And uh, by the way, the queue is closed, so <coughs> Mike, if you can take that to the chat, that'd be great. Um, I just entered myself in quickly to to say that I like the direction that Kazuho was going with this, and I am a uh, exported authenticators enthusiast. And I know in the next talk, uh, we will be talking about uh, secondary certs. And uh, I've been pushing there like, oh, we should only do uh, the server-driven ones. But this is actually a pretty good use case if you wanted to use it for clients and secondary certs. Should we move over? Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Ben. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. You can go take yeah. something and get discussion. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Eric Corbati, a secondary certificate enthusiast. Um, and uh, let's let's talk about them. Um, have a follow-up discussion um, from 
what we talked about in 117. So a quick recap uh, for those of you who either were not at 117 or you know, didn't read the draft. Essentially, uh, the TLS export authenticator spec um, you know, allows us to send and receive X509 certificates at the application layer. This draft is basically proposing that um, H2 and H3 get the capability to send unprompted secondary certificates to clients um, and make themselves you know, authoritative for different origins in the certificates. The way that we would do that is with a new frame type um, you know, on stream zero for like H2 and the server to client control stream for H3, which will actually carry those exported authenticators. And this work is ultimately based on an older draft that the working group has discussed um, that was authored by Mike Bishop, Martin Thompson, and Nick Sullivan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so before we jump into the main discussion here, I um, thought I would briefly go over the revisions to the draft uh, since last time we talked about it. Um, these changes are primarily focused around um, clarifying the, the vision um, of the draft. Um, so for one thing, um, we made more clear that we are using the uh, spontaneous server authentication flow um, in the exported authenticator spec. Um, which means that the server is going to be sending the certificates completely unprompted. Um, this does mean that the server ends up choosing the certificate request context kind of arbitrarily. Um, the current draft just kind of states it's implementation dependent, but um, that is something that we could fill um, if there was any use um, for it. Like if we wanted to be able to correlate what cert was used for a given request and whatnot. Um, other than that, uh, we, are, we are also more clearly um, suggesting the usage of the origin frame um, in the absence of a DNS check or both. You can, the, the point is that origin is more strongly suggested um, and any re remaining references, hopefully, um, to client certs have been scrubbed. Um, the H2 framing is unchanged for now. Um, as I said, the current focus is clarifying the vision for the document. Next slide, please. So ultimately, um, I think the meat and potatoes of the discussion here is like, what is different this time that makes this work uh, potentially useful for the working group to pursue? I would say that there are two angles here which kind of come together to form a story here. The first is that the scope of this document has been very intentionally um, reduced um, from the original one. Um, there are no client certs, and even for the server authentication, we are only using the spontaneous, um, you know, unprompted certificates. And the, the previous draft, um, which, you know, did have client certs, ended up being very complex. Um, and ultimately, I think the problem space that client certs and server certs kind of pose are separate enough that if there was interest in pursuing client certificates, like for what we were just discussing, um, that might be done more effectively in a separate document. Um, as for the other angle here, um, is that ultimately there are demonstrated interests in multiple use cases here, even to the level of implementation. Um, the main use cases that I think have been discussed um, are like, for one, like the standard like CDN, like coalescing use case, where we are essentially, you know, giving the capability to more granularly, you know, control the certificates that the client is receiving. Um, you can send certs like reactively based on, you know, if they open a connection for a particular origin that you might know a set of certs that you would want to send in response to that. Um, and, you know, and not using these like gigantic cruise liner certs. Um, the other main use case that we've discussed is this hybrid proxy use case um, where we're able to make a mask forward proxy um, able to sort of act as a reverse proxy for particular origins and kind of using the secondary certs that are coming in as the signal to switch to the reverse proxy mode for those given origins. Next slide, please. 
So really, ultimately, the thesis here, um, as far as like why this work might be better suited for the working group to be spending time with now, um, is because this scoped down version um, enables interesting use cases. Um, and I think that the scope is low enough and that the use cases are interesting enough um, <coughs> that it would be worth taking another shot at this. Um, ultimately, I think as far as what future changes would be need to be made by the working group to this document, um, we'd probably want to focus on change that enables the currently identified use cases and there's actual implementation interest and or experience um, rather than um, change that is necessarily enabling new use cases, though obviously that can always be negotiated. Um, Ultimately, the way that the draft is written now should not be blocking any future expansions on this concept. If we wanted to do client certs, I don't see a reason why we couldn't do it in you know, a separate document um, and use similar mechanisms. Uh, so with that said, um, you know, this document remains seeking an option um, in the working group. Um, any questions or concerns? Uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Lucas, I think, was first. Um, while he's getting to the mic, I'll just say, you know, like, like Harry said, we have done work in this area before. We paused or, or stopped because of, of, I think, the complexity as well as uh, concerns about implementer uh, interest and support. So I, that's where my interest is, is in the discussion here right now. Go ahead, Lucas. Hi, Lucas Padu, I, I, I support adoption of this with its current limited scope. I think there's some things even within that that we would want to discuss. So for example, the hybrid proxy use case, you're going to get into a situation where you have um, long lived connect tunnels and, and requests that would need to be multiplexed together and how we prioritize those. You don't need to be concrete, but just something like you should really think about those two <laughs> things together if you're using it for that model. And whatever mm -hmm. other um, people come up with, like to me, to my mind, there's, there's no similarity between client sits and service sits, except for the fact that they were sits and we're trying to overload one frame to do two things and frames are super cheap. So like, let's just punt on that one and we'll come back and do it next year if, if people really want it. Um, so hence, yes, support for <coughs> what's presented here. Thanks. Alessandro. Alessandro Guidini, Cloudflare. Um, so, I mean, I was in favor of the previous certificate, you know, draft and even with like the uh, sort of reduced scope, this is still useful. And as you said, you know, it opens the way for, for more work in the future. Um, I guess, I, I mean, as Mark said, like part of the reason why the original draft sort of fizzled out was um, there wasn't a lot of interest from like implementers and specifically client side implementers. Um, I don't know if that changed um, I guess with the with the new you know mask use case that's maybe like less of a concern, um, but still like to to actually for this to be useful, for example, for the 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 smaller certificate scope use case, then and specifically for me uh, at Cloudflare, then it would be useful to know that you know there are there are clients um, browsers ideally that want to implement this. Right and. I think that case is potentially m more challenging as far as gathering interest is concerned. Um, whereas the, the hybrid proxy one is a little easier because you can potentially just special client, special server, um, ra rather than a generalized support from browsers. Um, but yeah, that is certainly a point worth considering. David Skenazi, uh, authenticate, authenticating things over HTTP enthusiast. Um, well, I mean, it's just briefly on the um, point of implementation, I'd say if hypothetically someone working for a fruit company were working on adding support for this in their stack for mask, it might accidentally fall into Safari. Like that's not completely out, outside of the realm of possibility. Um, and that might push other browsers to be interested. Um, I can't speak for Chrome specifically here. I don't work on Chrome anymore, but I think in general, this sounds like useful work. I like the tighter scope, uh, same way that Lucas described it. Uh, let's, 
I would support this moving forward. Mike. Mike Bishop, resurrecting of my old draft enthusiast. Um, <laughs> I will note that they were originally separate drafts and the working group said to combine them. And yeah, now we're splitting them Is this I told you so? <laughs> A little bit, but also I might write the corresponding draft again. Jonathan. Yes, I support adoption. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so obviously I, I'm a proponent of the not scoped down version of this because I want the client side stuff. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're, we were discussing earlier about unprompted auth and how it's so similar to exported authenticators. And one of the problems we had was like, oh, exported authenticators uh, doesn't do like spontaneous clients and there's bad support. It sort of feels like we're just locking ourselves into doing that whole cycle all over again and like doing twice as much work as is necessary. Just like leave out the section that says, oh, and we don't support clients and just support clients. Like you, you have to take out text to add more support. I would say that there are a number of mechanisms in order to support the client side, like part of it, part of this that are necessary to do it like well and safely. Um, and those I think were a lar in large part um, where a lot of the complexity in the old draft came from. I'm, I'm about to close the queue by the way. Um, yeah, so I, th I think uh, punting on the complexity is, is fine if the working group is sort of at least willing to consider that that work will just come back again and we'll just do twice, like, like the work will happen twice. And it's just, yeah. Okay. Eric. Eric Nygren, Akamai. Also, I think I... I was also more interested in the client side part of this. So, um, I continue to worry that with the server side of this, that if we don't, if we do it in a way that we don't also require the DNS check, we're going to keep having a you know, new risk um, profile show up um, in terms of, uh, it, as we've discussed before, when this, when, this, when, we've, when this has come up before for discussion. The, I, I, I should note that the current draft does absolutely recommend the DNS check as well as um, origin. Um, are you suggesting that it should be mandatory? I think it. I think that if having the DNS check is either mandatory or, or um, for the general use case would um, would make would make sense. Um, there's also a presentation at MapRG a few IETFs ago that showed kind of an upper bound of benefit fit for this in the web case, which, which was pretty small for how often this could get reused, which was, um, which if that actually was as, as that is it up bound might be is somewhat disappointing in terms of what the value is in the general case for how usable it might be. I, I'd like us to stay focused on adoption and this sounds like something that could be a post adoption discussion. Um, Tommy speaking not as chair, but as a doing work enthusiast. Um, just to respond to what Jonathan was saying, um, like, yeah, absolutely sympathetic to having client use cases, but at least my impression was also, given the discussion we had for um, unprompted auth, we may want some tweaks at the TLS level of the definition here. Um, so, and I, I would volunteer to help work on anything we need to do to update documents there. But I think that's going to end up being a different track. And we can do the work. I think in this working group, we've done a pretty good job of pushing th like smaller documents through and without too much overhead and process. And I hope that uh, you know we as the chairs could help drive that. So I, I don't think that it necessarily imperils the efforts on client certs to try to scope things down. And hopefully, you know, at least what we found, like just doing any of this encourages more stacks to uh, implement export authenticators and do that basic work 
And once that's available, building on top of it is a lot lower effort. And I think we're going to have more exploratory authenticator use going forward based on that. Um, so we're over time, but um, I think we're at a place where we probably need a bit more discussion, uh, maybe a little more discussion, especially about implementation intents. Um, but it, it does feel like with a little more discussion, personally, I think we could issue a call for adoption in the reasonable future. Yeah. Um, let's get a sense of the room uh, just to see where we're at right now. I'm going to do a poll, uh, oh, sorry, a show of hands. Uh, I think the last wording we said was I support adoption or something to that yeah. effect. So um, starting the poll, if you support adoption, do yes. If you do not, say no. If you're unsure, you don't have to do anything at all. Or if you don't care, of course. Okay, so, and we have, I think, about the same number of people in the room, peer pressure. And, and this is, by the way, adoption with the scope described, of course. Uh, we, we've tried with a different scope and that didn't work out, so. And we'll give it just a few more seconds for those people hovering over the yes and no buttons. Insert meme here. Okay. I'm going to close now. So that was uh, 24 with a yes, three for a no, uh, and 43 with no opinion. Uh, we heard some people expressing some reservations. If there's any new information, I think at this point, uh, let's take it to the list and we'll, we'll continue the discussion there. So thank you very much, Eric. That was good. All right, moving on. Finally, we have uh, two presentations with a little bit of overlap. Uh, We'll start with the braid. No? no? We'll start, sorry, with the per resource. Okay. So if you want to share yourself or can I do it? Okay. Uh, he, so do you want to forward the slides? Yes, oh, please oh, finish. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so press the slide button. The, 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 big, the big file button. Uh -huh. And then I will say yes, and then you find your slide deck. Hello, I'm Rahul, notifications enthusiast. <laughs> so let me start with some shameless self-promotion. So I'm building a operating environment called Centripise and with a teeny tiny ambition that I will one day replace all desktops and home screens with this thing. Uh, I think desktops are a historical mistake, but that's another discussion. So as, as part of this, I use Solid for storage. Now Solid is great because it provides me a place to, uh, allows me to give users a place to store data and in a vendor independent way. So there's no lock-in. However, the notification systems in Solid looks a bit like this. There's no animation. No, it's, it's a PDF. So let's see. Hmm. That, it, I, I, I'm not sure if the thing just go on. Yeah. Can, can yeah. you run it or? No, this yeah. is the only option we have. Oh, okay. That was the best part of the presentation. Yeah. So it looks like this. I'm the author, I'm one of the authors. Even I struggle with this sometimes. 
And this does not explain how the server side coordinates. So it looks a bit like this. And then the client side has to coordinate, so it looks a bit like this. We really want things that are a little bit simpler. And again, the picture does not load. Mm. The censorship going on from the ITF. OK, so this is for resource events. It's a very simple idea. You send a request. You get your representation. And following that, any notifications that come are streamed to you. And you can do this on a per resource basis. So this is your ordinary HTTP request. You just add one more uh, header to it, and that is a request for notifications. So if this were your ordinary response, uh, there is the response becomes a multi-part response where the first part will be your representation and the second part will be notifications. The only important thing to see here is the events header, which tells, okay, this is prep protocol and it has some status. This is the old, the one you've shared is the old presentation. Uh, that happened, yeah, the, uh, um, sometimes it doesn't update when you do it the last minute, so that's, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that explains it. So there are some, mis there's a mistake here, so. Okay. Anyway, so uh, there is then there is a very header which says accept events, uh, customary HTTP stuff, and there's an accept events header as a courtesy, like next time when you negotiate, you can negotiate with prep. And then the second part is a multi-part digest which will contain all the notifications. So yeah, uh, Please ignore the hello IETF part. That should not be there. Uh, so it's basically right now it is, uh, it's in the format of a, a HTTP uh, message, but it's really actually RFC 822 format. And we've added some additional semantics, something which we can discuss further go going ahead. And you get a notification, then you uh, the resource is deleted. Another notification, because the resource is deleted, we'll just close the screen. And those uh, separators are the standard way to do it according to RFC 2046. So, A uh, couple of variations on the request. So you can do content negotiation for the notification. So here I'm doing uh, asking for notifications in JSON LD. Uh, I believe this is the favorite format of this group. Uh, this is a second example where uh, you can ask the uh, uh, notifications to be sent without a representation. So I've repurposed last event ID in this case. Uh, I'm a little ambivalent about using last event ID because it clashes with uh, server sent events. Uh, but uh, in this case, I'm just saying, uh, because it's a star, just send me whatever notification you have coming up. So why not serve, uh, use uh, event source or service sent events? So I think everybody knows what that is. So uh, you, you couldn't buy this in any other color except black. That was Hen uh, Henry Ford's diktat. Similarly, what WG's diktat is, you cannot stream it in any other format unless it's text event stream. So this is really unhelpful because one is you can't do binary. Of course, you can base 64 encode it, but it's not there. And you, uh, uh, for clients, it's just a hassle. Also, event source is kind of dead in the water because uh, what WG does not intend to develop this any further. Okay, so why not use uh, web sockets, web hooks? So the main thing is you are protocol hopping at this point. Your, your resources is on HTTP, but you have to go to another protocol to get your notifications. And so this creates the need for discovery. So you have to 
go to the HTTP resource, look at a link relation or something like that, and then uh, follow that link and get your notifications. Uh, your semantics are really like you have endless choice of what you can do on WebSockets and that basically every designer does their own thing and uh, applications have no standard to follow. So that's not nice. And the last thing is typically the design pattern is that you get uh, updates from multiple resources on uh, for, uh, from a single endpoint or a hub or whatever you want to call that. And uh, the server will send updates for all those resources and then the client has to separate them and then uh, figure out what to do with the data. So that's not nice. Uh, with here, we, we just have for every resource, the updates are for that resource only. So uh, there is, uh, since I've been uh, working with the solid community on this, so there is, uh, I have uh, written a companion uh, standard, which is for uh, link data. It is called uh, solid prep. Uh, <clears throat> so solid community server already intends to, uh, has said yes to implementing this. I, I have to just put in uh, the official feature request now, which will be done after this IETF. Mind you, this has been just uh, three or four months since I've uh, put up the standard itself. And there's also public interest from another solid uh, server vendor and uh, many people who, want to, who are implementing applications on solid have been asking me for this as well. So that brings me to you guys. So this is my first time at IETF. Uh, I had no idea about how it was here, so I'm asking you uh, if you can help me figure this out. So there's some specific questions I have. Are there better ways to frame messages? Uh, is there a better semantic, even if we use multi-part framing, can we do better semantics for RFC 822 messages that are there? Any ideas on headers? And of course, if you have other feedback, I'll just leave that up so that uh, it's there for anyone to comment on. Thank you. So um, we are time constrained at this point. So um, I think we're just gonna ask for question of clarification at this point. Austin, was, was that a question of clarification or keeping in mind that we are time constrained? We can also ask it after that. Use partial content. Okay, that's not a question of clarification, but thank you. Um, okay, so let's uh, leave that for a moment. Thank you very much and move on uh, uh, and we'll talk about braid for, and then we'll have a more general discussion hopefully, although we are unfortunately running out of time. Okay, so I did the push this button. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I need to do Sorry, I, I did have a clarification question. Um, can it wait to the end when he's back on stage? Um, I would prefer to ask it now. Well, sorry, we have 10 minutes left. Just give it a moment. Please go ahead. Okay. You're good. Uh, all right. So um, the point here is to open a discussion on this idea of adding synchronization to HTTP at the high level. So I'm going to try to just frame the, the dialogue quickly and then get us to discussion. So um, let's start. Okay. So a little bit of history, which just to, so HTTP was designed initially for static pages. Okay. So it's request response and uh, the server will give a, the page to the client. Now you can ask yourself, what happens if the page changes after it gives it to the client? And that's why we, we just punt it and have a reload button. And that made a lot of sense. When pages were written by hand, everything was static. But over time, pages started changing, maybe once a day, once a week. And then we got JavaScript and XML HTTP requests. You didn't have to click reload anymore. And now we have WebSockets, and you expect everything to be real-time collaborative by default, where it's all loading, but there's still a reload button because we haven't adju um, addressed HTTP. And so what's happening behind the scenes is, um, first we added these databases, and now we have kind of like a non-standard state on the server. It's not on a standard, but it's being funneled through HTTP. But then we add JavaScript, SMH HTTP request, and now we have to work around HTTP uh, because HTTP doesn't give us updates and doesn't give us synchronization. And then you have this 
model view controller framework on this client to synchronize all your state. And this is why web programming sucks. And you end up having to add even more stuff just to tame it all. And this will be a lot better if this non-standard state could be on HTTP and could be standardized, which you could happen if HTTP supported synchronization. Um, the, um, and so there are three problems here. One is that it sucks for web programmers. Two is that the, um, the non-standard state becomes, lo uh, it's locked into each website. And so you don't get interoperability across websites and that leads to walled gardens. And the third problem is that we can't support the state on standardized infrastructure like caches, proxies, and CDNs. Um, it's just funneling through WebSockets. So the big idea here is it's time to evolve from state transfer to state synchronization. So I'm opening the question, what do we think about adopting into HTTP the goal of synchronization? We go from representational state transfer to representational state synchronization. And HTTP, it's already moved beyond just hypertext, but we can also move into a synchronization protocol. And um, so synchronization starts out really simple. You just send the state from A to B, but it evolves into a lot more when you want to have multiple editors, you want perf higher performance, so you don't want to have to push the whole thing each time. You want delta compression, you want reliability and consistency, and you want new types of um, networks and versioning. So there's a big scope there, but we have a well-characterized scope, and this is in the Braid HTTP draft. This is a scoped version of this where everything fits together, and it provides this general guarantee that multiple writers can make simultaneous edits arbitrarily across any network delay and any topology um, within client server HTTP world to any content type and guaranteeing consistency provides a lot of benefits. And uh, we have a bunch of implementations. This actually works. We have a Chrome extension where you can see what it's like to go to a text file and have it live update without clicking reload. It can have collaborative editing. The dev tools have a little panel that show you the history. Um, it works in live apps, like up, on the, up, up in the upper right. So you can build your web state this way, have it all synchronized. And it also gives you in the bottom left this abstraction where you can program with distributed state like a local variable because it just it hides the network from you and it works. It all merges perfectly. So um, to implement this, most of the features are actually already there. We have to combine, so um, resumable uploads and byte range patch are important because they give you the ability to update a range of a resource. And we can actually implement with the Braid HTTP spec, we can implement resumable uploads. And we need a common extension that byte range patch is adding. And we also need subscriptions like prep. And then the only thing we need to support these great CRDT OT algorithms that give you the distributed state sync is versioning and a merge type. These are the four improvements we need. So um, this is a, a feasible scope. If we add these features um, to the subscriptions and updates and patches, these are already in the works. Versioning is a new thing, but it's very simple. It's just two headers, one for a version and one for the parent. So you get a DAG and then the merge type is a simple spec. Um, that will give us a really great synchronization technology. So um, now I'll open up to discussion. What do you think? about adopting the goal of state synchronization into HTTP in some scoped fashion. Um, here's a potential scope, and you can see the spec for an example. Um, I think that's, that's it. I'd lo just love to hear thoughts on that question. Great, thank you, and, and, and thank you for doing that so concisely. Um, so again, uh, questions of clarification, and we can start with, with Alex in the back. If you wanna come back up to the, ta uh, to the stage, please. Uh, Question of clarification. Obviously, these are, are big topics, but let's start the discussion now in the time we have left. Uh, David Skenazi. Um, so, changing like the goal of HTTP is daunting, um, and I I understand when you say. HTTP was designed for in a different era, but we've also evolved it since. And that's what you know everyone here has been kind of working on. And it's working quite well. Um, web's doing all right. And I would say from experience, having seen how things work at ITF, um, big paradigm shifts never happen incrementally. And so I don't think 
a paradigm shift for HTTP is like in the cards. Um, however, when you say we're almost there, that's where you should focus in my opinion. Take the list of things where we're not quite there yet, but we could be, and bring those individual extensions to HTTP or new, you know, all those things, bring them here. That's what we do and maintain such that HTTP has what you need. But I don't think that like, we don't even, like, HTTP doesn't have a goal. It's not even a well-defined construct that we have. So I wouldn't push for that. I don't, wouldn't know where it takes us. Can I have one clarification on that? Sure. Um, uh, what I mean by adopting the goal is let's take these, uh, some of these existing features, like reasonable uploads and the patches, and then let's adopt subscriptions, like prep or Mercure, and let's just make sure they work together to meet this use case of doing a CRDT, and that will provide a whole breadth of abilities, general features. Uh, so in that case, then what you're describing is something kind of similar to the web, where folks here have built many extensions to HTTP and many other protocols like WebSocket and WebTransport, and then the W3C is a separate body that kind of ties it all together and creates the web. We also use HTTP for other things. So I would say what I recommend you bring here is all the bits in HTTP, and the, but the tying together would be somewhere else. Okay, we, we, we've got other folks in the queue, so let's, let's move through that, yeah. Uh, Kevin. Kevin? No? Remote? Okay, we'll have to move on then. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Kevin Danglas. Um, I'm the author of a quite similar protocol called Mercure that I already proposed to the uh, IETF uh, working group uh, a while ago. Uh, the main difference between uh, Mercure and PrEP is that it is focused on working with the current state of the, the web, including with technologies not able to maintain persistent connections like uh, PHP or CGI and things like that. And uh, the, the protocol is already implemented and used in a lot of frameworks. So I, I can say that I support this initiative because there is a need uh, and there is a, a, a strong need for standardization. Many, many frameworks are adopting Mercure, uh, but Mercure is not taking uh, uh, the opportunities that are granted by HTTP2 and HTTP3. It's something that has been designed to work now. Uh, and I think that we can do better if you, we work at the protocol level. So uh, as there is a need and there are uh, many people interested in these technologies, it would be nice to uh, have the ability to standardize something. Okay. Okay. I'm going to close the queue because of the time. Yeah. Alex. Um, hi, I just had a quick clarifying question, which boils down to why HTTP? I'm kind of curious what the clients and servers in this model are, because when I saw the, the communication slides about why all these things work together, there were a bunch of protocols there that weren't HTTP. So I, my question is like, who's use, who would use this? Why do we need to do this in HTTP? Why isn't something like a streaming RPC protocol or something else more appropriate? For one, it's much easier to use HTTP uh, for clients. And even when we are developing solid notifications protocol, uh, a common uh, one of the sub protocols we ended up using is HTTP streaming. So we just thought it might make just more sense to standardize things on HTTP itself. Okay. Um, and, and I got in queue to very briefly say, I, I think that these are interesting things to, for us to be thinking about adding to HTTP. One of the goals that we have is to make sure that the different functions of HTTP or the different capabilities are well integrated. And I think that's where a lot of the focus would need to be here is, for example, intermediation and how does that play into this and how can we make sure that intermediaries, intermediaries can provide value as well as HTTP 2 and 3 and, and multiplexing and efficiency and you know, all the other facilities from redirection to authentication to everything else. So I think that, that would be the areas that I would be exploring and, and figuring out what the basic, you know, I think especially, Michael, what you're proposing is a new set of functions that go along all those others, which creates, you know, a matrix that we need to consider. Um, Mike. Mike Bishop, I wanted to say, first off, I have 
been watching your work on Braid for a while and I really appreciate it. I think it's an exciting direction. I also want to say from an ITF perspective, I feel like the closest parallel here um, is David's work on Mask. Like four years ago, you brought a vision of what Mask could be to a boff. And we're still writing drafts to make that vision happen. The pieces are not all there yet, but you wrote up the scenario, you presented it, and the bricks are coming together. And it's actually pretty exciting. And I think Braid is in kind of the same space that what you're talking about here is not so much a piece of work as a vision statement of where we can get if we build these 16 pieces, 12 of which we may already have. Um, and I think there is room for that in the IETF, but it doesn't necessarily belong as a draft itself. So you're suggesting a ball for a working group? Maybe as a venue to get people talking about the scenario, but I'm, I'm still mostly in line, like the actual work is gonna happen as find the pieces by themselves that we're missing, mm -hmm. bring them to the appropriate working groups, and let's build this thing. And if I could interject, I think it, it's, it's kind of a little top down versus bottom up. And, and the, the, the individual components need to be able to stand on their own, as it were. Yeah. Um, you're saying this is top down? Um, or what Mike this is, is, is top you, down? the draft is top down, yeah. Oh, the draft but, is but top down. The, but the work would happen bottom up. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's how we generally do things. Uh, do yeah. you find that, so you, you read, you perceive the draft. Let's talk after the meeting. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. uh, Austin, and then we're done? Yeah. Austin, 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 I think you've got the last word. Hey, last word. Um, yeah, uh, Austin Wright, partial content enthusiast. Um, just one of the missing components here that I wanted to identify for the working group is uh, sparse resources where some regions are undefined either because they haven't, haven't been uploaded yet or because it has not been uploaded, like it's a live stream or a shift buffer. Um, that's something that's going to be important for state synchronization among other uses here. So um, yeah, seconded. Okay. I think we're done. It sounds like that's an ongoing discussion, I would say. And let's chat after the meeting and, and, and perhaps take the discussion to the list. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll see you in Brisbane. See you in Brisbane. Yeah. Thank you.